So uh, today uh, we continue uh, class two. Uh, we are we are as to remind everyone uh, that uh, uh, we are now moving. This is part two of our classes in Genesis, and we are moving. We move from Noah now to Abraham, ten generation. There were ten generation between Adam and Noah. We dealt with in our first part, now from Noah to Abraham and circumcision, and theft, uh, the part two. So today, we, last time we described the society after the flood, we mentioned uh, Noah, the misfortune, and uh, he was all naked on the ground, and uh, uh, his two sons cover, cover his nakedness, uh, which is a source of a prayer shawl, talit, that I think it would be very appropriate for Noach Haidt to wear uh, in prayer, covering the prayer shawl should cover the head, the body from head to, to, the, uh, to the heel. Uh, it can carry seven, uh, uh, if you want seven colors, it would be beautiful. It wouldn't have the uh, fringes, uh, that because fringes are spe specific for the 613 commandment of Sinai, whereas uh, uh, Noah had a more concern about the seven commandment. So it should be scary, something that remind us the seven commandment, which could be like the seven colors, let's say. So the, and then we describe also how the first generation uh, spread over earth and uh, spoke one language and uh, it was an ideal situation. Uh, so let's start move now in our class today to continue and we describe the Tower of Babel. So as an introduction, I would say the following. Let us note that our world today is increasingly more controlled by large corporations whose budget and power surpasses most countries' budget combined. Nationality also today is losing ground and we found our, as we found ourselves living in one large village, driven by economy and consumerism that embraces different product producers from all over the world as to produce one, one little gadget. Many of those giant international corporations operate in obscurity. The leadership is warped uh, by thick layer of hierarchy hidden from the public eye and scrutiny. For instance, many Americans would be surprised to learn or to know that the modest looking UPS company controlled fleets of airplanes, ships, and other modes of transportations as well as giant electronic plants and insurance companies and other manufacturing giants, plant, giant plants whose budget is beyond imagination. This is just the UPS. Most of those giant international corporations are run efficiently by elaborate AI technology and supercomputers. In fact, the decision-making has, has been removed from our human CEO and given into those hand, to the hand of those super machines who are smarter and capable of gathering and processing information better than any human mind. They possess data, the large quantity of data better than us. The new game in the market today is information and data. So much 
the, the expert talk today about a new religion, the Dataism, a new God. Whoever controls the data, they say, is control the universe. And since the amount of information gathered today is, is beyond uh, the capability of our mind, it's so large, only, only those machines can make a, a meaningful decision for us. Mankind I would not be able to live from now on in force uh, without those inform information machines capable of processing and the data and making decision for us. Dataism also means that this machine know better and everything about us, about ourselves, better than we know about ourselves. The machine would know what, uh, who, should, who should we date? It will make our health decision for us, what surgery we should undergo. Uh, it will decide what, uh, whom should we vote for office and uh, what, was she, what was, should we eat and how should we live. Our species, the experts say, the old homo sapiens is about to be replaced, they say, by a new hybrid of men and machines, by ex that, by ex that, that extend our mind with artificial limbs, uh, and with chips that can process information more efficiently and more successfully and more delicately than individual mind, uh, hand. I, I myself witnessed an eye surgery done so delicately by, by a robot that uh, I was amazed uh, it was done in Memphis. That process of taking over, but the, the expert says, is inevitable and would arrive whether, whether we like it or not. And worse than all, the experts say, the old-fashioned religion and morality, like the, that of the Bible, would soon lose its meaning in the new world of uh, the new computer and would disappear. There will be no meaning of all the sin and repentance. Uh, all we need is to listen to what the machines tell us. Ins, they say, let us embrace ourselves to the new world of dataism, where the art of gathering and processing information and communication are supreme, where our individu individualism would have no, no more meaning or loses meaning. Well, despite of all those experts say, it seems that Moses does have a message to us, uh, particularly aimed at those threats, at this threat. Moses indeed could confirm that information and communication are, are good and supreme, but we need to be we need to prepare for ourselves and to, to listen to what the Torah says about it and how to overcome a threat and don't lose our morality. That message of Moses regarding this seemingly inevitable future is given to us by the story of Nimrod and Babylonian power. So let us read together uh, the story of Babylonian Tower and see the main point of it. So the story of Babylonian Tower or Tower of Babylon begins with this new society formed after the flood 
as we learned last week. Uh, the new generation, new society was comprised of 70 nations of Noahide descendant, spreading all over the world, speaking one language, having one faith, and reaching a common goal. And the goal was to produce, to own things, to trade things, to prosper in peace. In short, the dream of the United Nations has already came true. Among those new nations, one is particularly distinguished by the Torah, as it says, and I read for you, and the son of the children of Ham, Ham, were Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. And Cush begot Nimrod. So Ham, Noah's firstborn son, his descendants were the first to rule earth after the flood. Their list include Cush, Egypt, and Put, all the father of mighty nation and great civilizations that cover a large portion of Central Asia, Middle East, and Northern and Central, Central Africa. Ham first born Cush was the first leader of Noahide 70 nations, 70 family of nations. He is described as a righteous person, wise and respected by all. His name is still preserved in the mountain of Cush, around the Caspian Sea. The Torah then marks that he was the father, the proud father of King Nimrod. It was a, indeed a great Mary. So who was Nimrod? The Torah switched right away to describe King Nimrod. And it's as it says that Kudosh Kush began Nimrod. And he began to be a mighty one on earth, in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before Hashem. How can be a person mighty hunter before Hashem? Therefore, they say, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before Hashem, repeated. Repeat itself. And the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom was Babel, Erg, and Akkad, and Kila, the land of Shinar, in Mesopotamia. Now, when you read it, you need to have good ears to listen to what the verse is really saying. It's describing the ascent of, uh, of uh, Nimrod to his power. How he ascended, ascended to be a benevolent king, then turned into a tyrant without lifting his soul. So the first, the, the Torah first introduces Nimrod as a mighty man. This can mean simply that he was physically strong, beautiful young man probably brown in skin. But as the rabbi mentioned, who is mighty? It says a mighty man, who is mighty? Whoever control himself. So hence Nimrod was spiritually strong. He control himself before he control other people or humanity. So his desire said, let us rebel. Nimrod means let us rebel. Uh, but he controlled them. From whom did he learn that skill? From Noah. As the uh, rabbi said, in, in, if you remember the revelations, Noah, the revelation in Mount Moriah, after the flood, when he was frustrated offering his first burn offering, he saw Hashem and Hashem talked to his heart. Hashem was showing Noah. Noah was wondering about human heart. And Hashem says, talk to your heart. 
your heart is in your hand. So he learned from Noah. He learned many things from Noah, this young man. And the first thing he learned is to talk to his heart. So while his peers, the royal royalty of the king, palace, if you want, indulge himself in sex, wine, and, and who knows what, drugs, he controlled himself. He talked to his heart. He stayed away from trouble. The verse now add that he was a hunter before Hashem. How can be a, a person a hunter before Hashem? Well, Hashem hate uh, people who hunt and kill animal for sport. So there are many legends which you don't have to go now into it. How you learn to uh, cater to the animal. He, gain their, their, their uh, respect, their love. He was seen riding on the eagle, e eagle wings from where he could see the, sky, the earth from above. The thing that they prompted him later to build a tower to reach the sky. Uh, he was seen riding on lions. And he was fighting uh, human, ha human hunters. So Nimrod, let us rebel, as if it says, let us rebel against those people. He used to tell the animal, let, let us rebel against the hunters. That's another explanation. So it, we climb up in the meaning of Nimrod. And another thing now, the third level maybe of, of hunting, he hunted people. He learned to hunt people and to uh, gain their, their, their trust by listening the, to their wishes and understanding what they, want, what they say to him, even without words, just wimps. How did, it, how did that happen? So in short, the story goes like this. That uh, when we, Nimrod was still a young prince, his father, Kush, was hunted night after night by fearful dream about Nimrod. In his dream, he saw Nimrod ascending on his throne after he is gone, Kush, and people coming to speak to, to Nimrod, presenting their petitions, but uh, to, this, to, to Nimrod's surprise, uh, what they say seemed to be like barking animals. He couldn't understand what they say. And in his dream, Kush kept dreaming that when Nimrod, the king, the new king, tried to address these people, they perceived his words as barking. So there was no communication. And after a while, the people were fed up, toppled Nimrod, and actually killed him in his dream. So Kush woke up night after night sweating, fearing, and finally consulted his father Noah, or grandfather Noah, who understood that he said, from heaven to tell you now, the fact that you dream it after night after night, is a sign that heaven warned you, take care of this young fellow, young prince, he's gonna be a great king, but preparing for that, he's not prepared. What should I do, Kush asked. So Noah sent, said, you know, send him right now to the 70 nations and so, so he can spend time with each one and learn each, each nation desire and inspiration. So finally, when he come to power, we will understand him. He will not barking at him. So Kush smiled and understand, understood what Noah saying. And from there on, uh, he, he sent his young fellow, a young boy, Nero, to rotate between the 17 nations. And young Nero, but Kush warned him, he said, you know, you may spend time with each of the nation and they will, each one of them I know, will try to cater you, to teach you everything because they know me. And they know that one day you will be a king. And each one of them will try to draw you into his camp. That uh, they will tell you, let us rebel 
again together against your father. Uh, but that's but you remember me and never 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 uh, never uh, fall a prey to their uh, wishes. And uh, that's why his name is Nimrod. Let us rebel. And indeed, for the next few years, Noah rotated in the 70 nations, learning each nation this deeper, this deepest desire. And since this, each ruler knew that one day Nimrod would be the king, so they opened their heart and tried to, to, to gain this, his confidence and to teach him everything. So after a while, Noah, uh, Nimrod returned to the palace and uh, he never, he remained loyal to his father and his father took out his, his crown, put his Nimrod head and Nimrod became the new king. But now he was ready to become a king. So successful he was as a king, he could listen, understand the whims and the wishes of each one of the nations that came to him. So much against their trust that each one believed that he is one of them. Trust put his entire, their entire trust in his, in him. And that's how peace prevailed and uh, Nimrod's name grew. And at, at the beginning, he was, as the verse says, at the beginning, he ruled over Mesopotamia, but in time, his rule spread all over the continents, from Asia down to, to Africa. Uh, so this was how Nimrod, King Nimrod, ascended to his, to his power as a democratic, benevolent king who consult, who know how to consult is a subject to listen to their desire in Hebrew Melech. Melech is a king who consult, who know how to consult uh, his, uh, his people and to address their need. So how come that this Nimrod became now the greatest tyrant of earth? How is it, how could it be? So the story is, that King Nimrod could have remained benevolent, democratic king ruler forever, and not a new technology came and changed everything, as in our days. New technology come and change everything. Today with the internet and smartphone, we are not the same as 18th century or 19th century people. Certainly not. So here's the technology change everything. What was the technology? The verse tell us exactly what it was. And I read it for you. And it came to pass as a journey from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwell there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn a fire. And the brick will serve them, serve them as a stone, and the mortar, mortar will serve them as clay. The new technology prompted new project, building project. At the beginning, it was small, as archaeologists said. They built new homes, new city walls, then new towers. And archaeology really confirmed the massive building of new brick, uh, store, brick, uh, store, brick uh, uh, building, out, especially around 3000 BC in Mesopotamia. And then at the same time, a massive building about in, 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 in Egypt too, the first pyramid. 2500 BC. This massive project were, were done, we should note, not by slaves, but rather by three young farmers who left their farms to join the new building project in the city. 
those young volunteers spend several months a year on a project, enjoying good food, good company, and entertainment, things that they never had on their own farm. That's archaeology confirmed now. That's how the pyramids were built and the Babylonian towers were built. Moreover, these young fellows were thrilled to participate in a project that is bigger than their own form, family form. At the project now, they could meet other young people from all over the country. Interesting now young, new young friends from all over the world actually, and exchange ideas with them, share the same experience. It was a beautiful experience for them. They look forward to, to come and participate in the project. On the project, they were developed the first time in their life, the sense of belonging to a large organization that is more powerful than their own farm. Like today, somebody will uh, join a company like, uh, uh, like uh, you know, Apple or anything that is larger than you can even imagine. It's free of belonging to such a company. Scholars say that those huge buildings projects serve as a consolidate the notion of a nation, the notion of a country, and even the notion of social structure. The worker loved to join the project and were proud to take part in it. King Nimrod is the master of listening to what, what the people have in their heart, took a note. As the word, the, now the verse continue to say. And they, the builders, said to, to one another, come. Let us big for ourselves a city and a tower whose top, whose top shall reach the sky. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we scatter all over the face of the whole world. The verse described the workers' world inspired by the project. They discovered that on the project, they could make a name for themselves becoming officers, having a rank, coming up, climbing up on the ladder of society. On a project, like in the military, they could climb up on rank, fame, title, uniform, honor, something they could never have on the back on his farm, on the farm. King Nimrod saw and took notice of that. And he took advantage of that thrill. And slowly and gradually, he offered them greater and bigger, larger projects that assembled more and more people around it. Finally, he came up to the idea of the major Babylonian tower. And he says, let us make a name for ourselves. Now, like in any larger organization, even today, the building project of that time required specialization. Things they didn't have on the farm. One worker excel in making bricks. The other excel in combining and climbing on a scaffold. The other excel in cooking. And, and the other, and in other endeavor and so on. So they became specialists and made becoming especially made one proud. And, and it added the title to one name, increased the social status. Here came the thrill of hierarchy. The tower introduced a new social hierarchy. See our simple worker, there were managers, supervisor, and supervisor of the supervisors. Manag uh, King Nimrod himself was pushed up and up almost automatically on, the, on this hierarchy without lifting a sword, 
he became supreme. He sat in the pinnacle of this pyramid or the, or the tower. Some worker arose with him in the, in the ILT, with others remain at the bottom, but yet, to their credit, they, they share the common, the common sense of brotherhood. And they, didn't, they loved each other, and they united in one goal, to pursue one goal, to reach the sky. Let us make a name for ourselves. King Nimrod allowed the workers to make a name for ourselves, which means to engrave the name on a brick, on a corridor, on a tower building, on a whole wing. This wing belongs to this fellow, remember him forever. This established the builder fame forever for generations. Now, how big was the tower? Let us build a tower whose head in the sky. We do not know the real size of the tower. Tradition said that it was planned as 27 by 27 square mile base. Imagine, 27 by 27 miles base. Oh, that's how the rabbis saw it. And it was designed to reach 70, 27 mile height. King Nimrod assembled architect who designed it for him. He, he gathered all information in his door. Perhaps the dimension are exaggeration, yet we show sure that the tower was indeed an enormous endeavor on a scale unknown to mankind before or after. It required thousands and thousands of workers and would have taken hundreds of years to accomplish. Successive waves of workers came and gone. Generation passed and the tower was still be being built. A whole new culture developed around it. Songs were composed to its glory and stories of heroism were told from father to son. Son, Years ago, I stood on the third floor and this and this happened to me and to my friend. And here are the name of my glorious friend. We can imagine the great impact of the tower had on the economy. The worker needed organized food, clothing, shelter, and services, even entertainment, as we see actually in, in, in Archaeology pyramid uh, near the uh, digging near the pyramid. The, uh, the tower of Babel, like the Egyptian pyramid, prompted entire industries around it, created wealth and power, especially to those who sat at the top, like King Nimrod himself. Gradually, even unintentionally. King Nimrod's fame and status became divine. His skill as communicator excelled as the tower grew taller and taller. He controlled our enormous knowledge of, of how the building is to be built. He controlled the data. He was the master of dataism. While the workers comp only complied with the regulations, holding uh, 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 by Nimrod holding that knowledge secure his status. To the worker at the bottom of the hierarchy, he seemed unreachable, concealed by an army of shareholders, of subordinates. <laughs> he, he, his word became the law. No one challenges authority because everyone was thrilled to enjoy the economic boom, being part of belonging to such an important national endeavor. Everything went on and seemed well to Nimrod until finally the verse says that Hashem, suddenly the verse says, Hashem came down to see, Hashem, you'd have 
came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of Adam were building. It was not a lokim, it was not the attribute of just judgment, justice. Justice was prevailed. Everything was fine. The only one who took, who took care or note of that was a merciful attribute. You'd have FK. So what prompted her to come down? And the rabbi says, end Hashem. And when he says, end Hashem, mean it was her and her court. Meaning she came down not as a visitor. She came down, the merciful one came down to judge, to, to assess the building from her aspect, from her perspective. And it was bad. Why? What happened? Something really evil happened on, on, on the tower. Without breaking the law, with, with everybody was complying with the law and uh, being a faithful builder, yet something bad happened. There was prosperity, but Hashem didn't like it. She came down to see what, what happened. How could, she wonder, how could that be? So the, the, the rabbi says what happened. Tradition said that the project advanced and the, the tower became taller. It became more and more heartless and merciless. The tower went up and the accident became more and more frequent and more disastrous. Some of the many workers were injured or killed on a daily basis. The tower itself, they say, toppled at least three times, bearing underneath who knows how many builders and injured how many people. Yet, they started all over again. And amazingly, as more as accidents occur, the more a warlike mentality took place, a new vocabulary. Uh, let us conquer the flaw. Let us, let us make, make, we can conquer nature. We'll climb up despite the danger, a war mentality, a hierarchy. And that actually prompted, uh, elevated Nimrod status even more to the sky. So heartless and so merciless the project became that uh, when the uh, injury occurred, the rabbi said, and people, let's say, fell from a 10th floor to the ground with bricks in their head, in their hand, people around him lamented the brick rather than the, 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 wound, the injured person who nobody, nobody paid attention to. Him. So the life of the people became dispensable for the sake of the project. And that, to, the, to, for the, to sacrifice people for the bottom line, enrage Hashem. Nothing wrong was done when you talk about the law, but it was a merciless and heartless, so much that she came down. So here came the new meaning to his name, Nimrod, let us rebel. Rebel against whom? Rebel now against Hashem. We ignore it. We want the bottom line. We want the, the endeavor to be successful. We want to reach the sky. And as the tower became taller, his ego, Nimrod Eko also became bigger and bigger and taller. And um, gradually, he saw himself a divine force. Uh, he saw himself as deity. And to be such an arrogant person, the rabbi says, he and Hashem cannot be in the same world. 
if a person ego is big, Hashem run away from him or from the universe. Hashem cannot be in, in the same room with arrogant people with big ego. And they, they such, Nimrod developed such an enormous ego that Hashem could not stay with, it, with it in the world. She wanted to run away. But she did not run away. Instead, the verse says, and let's see what Hashem, how Hashem responded to it. The verse says, and Hashem said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and now nothing will be withheld from them to do that which they have scheduled to do. What a verse. Here the Torah admits, or actually announce, admit if a better word, that if people walk that way, uh, be merciless and ruthless, and following the rule of the jungle, and just wisdom and science, they can reach everything. Yes, everything that is scheduled to do, they will accomplish. Yoba acknowledge here that uh, and send a message to us that every selfish, indifferent, and heartless human organization can achieve its financial and political goal, even reach the sky. Yeah, no wonder that such, such a corporation can be extremely successful and satisfy its shareholders. Yet, uh, one per, one, only one entity will be enraged. Is a merciful one will be enraged if he throw away mercy, mercilessly people to the trash as a trash, mm. paying no attention to people suffering from from the wake of this growth taking no care of people who are dismissed or lose the job for the sake of the shareholders and so on. If we don't, yes, those companies can control and go. But the Torah says, I'm not so sure if you believe in God, if God, if you believe in God or not, but I'm telling you, God exists. And if she see that, you are not, you never break you never broke you have never broken any law. Yes. If you stand in trial and you can show, well, I took care of my, all my people and I did what what the law what the law says and uh, I I was particular to the to the finest point, but you were merciless. You ignore people's suffering. That's not in the law. If you do that, I will be enraged. So how did she respond? What did she do to, to the people? How she could have, you could say, you could have said she, she would properly, she would show brimstone on it, like in Song of the Moor. No, she did not do this. Let's see what he said. And Hashem says, he said, come. Let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another. She aimed beautifully. She aimed at the core of, the, of his power. He was master of communication. He was a master of uh, understanding people's whims. He could read people's mind. He could gather information, possess it, and send, send down information down the pipe to the walker. Your information, your data, dataism, that will enrage me, that will enrage her. She destroys this dataism, this communication. She corrupted the core of Nimrod's power, his skill to listen as a listener, as a communicator. The dream of his father came true. He spoke something and people perceive it as barking. 
illegible barking. They spoke to him and he perceived that as barking. And they talked to each other and each other didn't understand what the other people said. One person says, bring him, bring him the, the uh, uh, hammer and they gave him water. He asked water and they gave him a hammer. They didn't understand each other. So the result is that they dispersed. And they, from there, dispersed all over the earth. The tower was abandoned, finally destroyed. King Nimrod found himself isolated, finally was dead. About I mean, the story about how he finished his life, but that's not for us now to read. So what happened now, the few minutes, uh, after discuss uh, the word after Nimrod. Uh, uh, Nimrod introduced to the world the organization and its power. After his demise, people uh, tried to emulate him. In a tw between 3000 and 2500 BC, that's the period you see empire state armies and empire start to appear on earth the first time. Read K K uh, Karen Armstrong books about the history of the world, history of God. That the first time, I mean, people tried to emulate him. He had an emerald set on the pinnacle of a pyramid. He subordinated underneath it and everything was done for him. Why should not I be at the tower and sit on my tower and force people to do the job for me. King Nimrod knew how to at least attract people. He listened to them, offered them good things to inspire them to the world. They came on their own. He said, the people who, who replaced him Try to do it. They didn't have any talent to attract people to for the to do the job on the, on the field. So they learned to kept go invade other other nations whose language they could understand. Now they capture they go to another land, capture capture territories and slaves, force them to walk in the field, and new entity came. The royal. Uh, Karen Armstrong described it, the new warrior, the new warrior, uh, uh, the new warrior lord or something like that. Uh, a whole layer of society of people whose skill was only to fight, to martial army, who spent time to conquering, subduing, subjecting other people to pay taxes and uh, to walk by force in the empire. And from there until, the, until recently, only even now, even in, in uh, Ukraine, that's what we see today. So the idea that I can invade other countries and subject these uh, people to my rule, my desire, that started there. So, when uh, 10 generations later, when Abraham was born, this was the picture of the universe into which Abraham was born. Let's keep it in mind. Abraham was born into a world that was full of empires fighting each other, as you see it in the text, and uh, stealing each other countries, stealing each other wives, enslaving people to work. Everything around Abraham at that time revolved around theft, not theft like in our time on a street gang, robbing and mugging, but organized theft on a large scale that actually came to the world by the demise of Nimrod Nimrod Babylonian Tower. So here we are finishing our class today. And I, to summarize, yes, deism is not new. Moses acknowledges 
the possibility that such a tower, a corporation tower, can be built anytime and be very successful and even reach the sky and be indeed very successful. You can build a corporation that is so financially successful that can control multiple functions at the same time, budget larger than any country. Yet, if we forget the mercy for Hashem, we forget our, our, our human uh, fellow man and forget and ignore sorrow and don't care of those people who are thrown away in the wake of this success. If we forget them, if we are heartless, uh, there is no, no future for this growth. It will, we will see God, but it will end up with a shame coming down again, who knows, and, and uh, do her job to stop our evil doing. Any question for me?